Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word, Book of Deuteronomy, which is to say um, a repeat of the law by Moses in, in kind of common everyday language, not beefed up to where you have to be a Philadelphia lawyer or any other kind of lawyer to understand it, but right down in lay terms where about anyone can understand. Uh, Moses putting forth this uh, book of Deuteronomy. And uh, naturally, uh, the Greek name is Deuteronomy, but the Hebrew name is these words. And these are the words, the Word of God, that will change your life. And Moses is kind of reiterating some of the things that happened, how they came to Kadesh Barnea. Uh, the being the place where many of the people refused to go in to the promised land after God promised, hey, I've cleaned it out for you. It's, it's all taken care of. Go, if there's a land of plenty. Go right on in. And they sent 10 people in the last lecture. And in reality, uh, two of them came back and were ready to go. It would be Caleb. And, and, uh, and he was... Uh, honored for that. But the others, they, there was a, I will always believe there was an old mountain with a rugged or a little, they called it the giant's backbone because it looked like a backbone. And I think this spooked them pretty good. <clears throat> and then finally when God pronounces the sentence, you're not going in, as a lot of people will do, they decided, oh, well, we are. We're going to gird ourselves up and we're going to go right on in there. And the Lord told Moses in verse 42, uh, say unto them, go not, neither fight, for I am not among you, lest you be smitten before your enemies. In other words, what kind of crew is this? And you wanna, you wanna stop and remember, Christ, had, God had already opened the Red Sea for them. He had, he had um, defeated Pharaoh's army for them. He had coddled them, protected them. And here they wouldn't trust him up to this point. Now they've decided they're going to show him. Verse 43, as we come to in chapter 1, the great book of Deuteronomy, let's go with it. And it reads, So I spake unto you, and you would not hear, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord and went presumptuously up into the hill. There you went. Verse 44, And the Amorites, which dwelt in the mountain, came out against you and chased you as bees do, and destroyed you in Seir, even unto Hormah. They got thumped real good. You know, um, you want to learn a lesson from this? When you try something, whether it's a new job, whether it's a move or whatever it is, do you ever talk to the Father and ask Him to be with you? Is He with you? You know, you go out on your own up against the enemy and you're going to get your gourd thumped. You, you want to always have the Father with you with, um, in good standing. Ask Him. Okay. 45. And you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not hearken to your voice nor give ear unto you. Well, he had already pa passed sentence on them. That generation's going to die in the wilderness. You're not going to go into the promised land. Verse 46, so ye abode in Kadesh, they dropped Borneo, Kadesh meaning holy, uh, many days according unto the days that you abode there. They, here, abode means they're sitting still. When in all reality, they were supposed to be going up, going into the promised land. And here they sit 
until that generation passes away. And you might say, well, uh, and some probably would, well, God is a hard man. No, He's not. I mean, He had coddled them, taken care of them, fed them, and, and promised that the promised land was open to them. And they, wouldn't, they wouldn't listen to Him. And then when they tried it on their own, they got, their, they, they got um, beat. That's what will happen to you when you go forth without the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then we turned and took our journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spake unto me, and we compassed Mount Seir many days for a long time. Okay. Verse 2, And the Lord spake unto me, saying, Verse 3, You have compassed this mountain long enough, turn you northward. Verse 4, And he commanded, And command thou the people, saying, You are to pass through the coast of your brethren, the children of Esau, which dwell in Thier, and they shall be afraid of you. Take ye good heed unto yourselves, therefore. In other words, don't you give them any trouble. Don't you bother them. Five, meddle not with them. For I will not give you of their land, no, not so much as a foot breadth, because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for a possession. Now, I want you to picture in your mind where we're at here. Picture the Dead Sea as it runs north and south, and you're always at the southern. You're all the way at the southern end of it, and a little bit past there, you have Sierra. You have the area of Esau. Okay, and what what they're going to do with uh, Barney and Kadesh lying, oh maybe a hundred miles or, or less from the tip of the Dead Sea. Esau's country, they're going to march there, through there, and then they're going ultimately up the east side of the Dead Sea or the Salt Sea, whichever you wish to call, call, uh, call it. They will go all the way up to Mount Nebo, which is at the head of the Dead Sea, and here God will take Moses at that place, and the children will have to take the land themselves. But they will, and they'll be in good standing. But basically what we're going to do today is make that march that I'm describing to you there. Many things took part place in this very area. Let's, let's just call one or two of them to memory. At the very south end of the Dead Sea is where Lot's wife looked back and turned to a pillar of salt. And what a salty place it is. Even the trees gather, uh, plants gather salt on that end of the Salt Sea. And also Sodom and Gomorrah, very near there. And this is where they're going through different times in history, of course. But that's where the children will march on this day. Okay. Now, next verse, please. Verse 6. You shall buy meat of them for money that you may eat, and you shall also buy water of uh, them for money that you may drink, and you can dig it, and it will be no burden to them. Verse 7, For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness. These forty years, that's probation. Okay. The Lord thy God hath been with thee. Thou hast lacked nothing. Now, you know, that is really, their shoes didn't even wear out. A miracle, but it was divine intervention. When God intervenes, but uh, I wonder how those people must have felt that having a father like that that cared for the little ones that were growing up there. It was only the those that were of age to war that refused that God destroyed. Okay, and um, so. Uh, that they would see these even as they would pass away. And, and when they make this trip, that will mean it has happened. Eight, and when we passed by from our brethren, the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, through the way of the plain of Elath, and from 
E. Zion Gaber, uh, we turned and passed by the way of the wilderness uh, of Moab. In other words, this would be one, Moab being one of the offspring of Lot by his own daughters. And uh, verse 9, And the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle. For I will not give thee of their land for possession, because I have given Ar unto the children of Lot for a possession. Ar means city. I've given this city. It can also be a mountain or a hill, like Ar Magadan. That's the city of Megadio, Ar being city. Verse 10. The Emens dwelt there in times past, a people great and many and tall, as the Anakins, you know, were the giants. Okay, this is what the Moabites call the the uh, Nephili, the giants. The uh, uh, the Geber was Emons. Okay, verse eleven. But I want you to make special attention. It said in times past, well, because God had taken care of business, meaning there was nothing there for them to fear. Verse eleven which also were accounted giants as the Anakins, but the Moabites called them Emons. Emons in that tongue means the terror, holy terror. Frighten you to death. They were so huge. They, they sure didn't frighten David. He brought old Goliath down with uh, one sling stone. Verse 12. The Horams also dwelt in Seir before time. But the children of Esau succeeded them, inherited um, them, when they, had when they had destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their stead as, also, as Israel did into the land of his possession, which the Lord gave unto them. Um, the uh, Horam being the descendants of Horai. Okay. Verse 13. Now rise up said I, and get ye over the brook Zered. And we went over the brook Zered. Zered is about a quarter of the, about a third, a third to a quarter to a third of the way on the east side of, of the Dead Sea. It feeds into the Dead Sea. And when you cross it, it's kind of the boundary between um, Esau and you're traveling then on up into to the um, Moabites' land, okay? Verse 14, And the space in which we came from Kadesh Barnea until we came over the brook Zered was uh, thirty and eight years, until all the generations of the men of war were wasted out from among the host as the Lord swore unto them. In other words, God always, when God passes a sentence, it's usually final. There have been occasions where a good man of God, such as Moses or, or, or someone else, could, could uh, stay a decision on conditions that repentance or improvement would come, but it's rare. In this case, there was no backing away from the fact that that generation would die in the wilderness. They would have no pleasure from the promised land that God had prepared. Now let me tell you something. You want, you want to know that the millennium age is coming where everyone is in spiritual bodies and a person can take part in the most beautiful part of that promised land by overcoming and being on that side of paradise that where the overcomers uh, abode that you can enter that promised land, or as some of these dodos would do, you can refuse and go the other place. It's your choice. But this is that time to know that our Father, um, I'll say it, He means business. And when He speaks and when He passes that law, when He declares, and, and as it is written, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, these things happened as an ensample so you would know what would befall us in the end times. 
In other words, it's God's way of teaching us how to act and react and interact with the peoples of the world and our own selves <clears throat> to see that God's blessings flow, that, um, that we have those blessings. But here, that 38-year period, two years now to go on the 40, okay, and um, it, God is just about to cut them loose from the manna and the quail, and they're going to be on their own. They're going to have to provide for themselves as they go into the promised land, but that's good because there's plenty of fruit and everything there. Verse 15, for indeed the land, or for indeed the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from among the host until they were consumed, until they passed on. Um, verse 16, so it came to pass when all the men of war were consumed and dead from among the people, it's important that you know this was just the men of war, okay? 17, that the Lord spake unto me, saying, 18, thou art to pass over through our, the city, the coast of Moab this day. I want you to get across Zered, take all the people over, and go by that city of Moab. Or again, this could be translated hill as well, okay? 19, and when thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, Distress them not. Ammon, of course, is the brother to Moab. All right. Now, nor meddle with them, for I will not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon any possessions, because I have given it unto the children of Lot for a possession. It's theirs. Verse 20. That also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in old time. Now, will you underline that in your mind? Old time, they weren't there anymore. When God said the, the promised land is open and ready, it was, okay? I, the reason I do that, I want you to know when God says something's okay, it's okay. And the Ammonites called them Zamzumans. And what, what, well, what is Zamzumans? Uh, Zam Zumans means um, uh, great big terrors. Okay, it's the same Emmons, but it's great big. Okay, so bigger than ever. Okay, in their eyes it was, but they didn't exist any longer. Okay, twenty-one, a great people, and many and tall as the Anakins, but the Lord destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. They inherited that. It was theirs. God gave it to them. But God himself cleansed the land, made it livable and habitable to them, and how happy they were. 22, And he did to the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horms from before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead, even unto this day. And now, it's important that you pick up on the fact God does the cleansing. Now, let me remind you of something. When the great battles that cause everyone to shake and quake, the end of the world, and they, they shake with fear. Who, let me ask you a question, are you a scholar? Who fights those battles? It's certainly not going to be you. Our Heavenly Father fights them. We have nothing to do with it. That's why you can count on Him. You can depend on Him. You're to take care of business in your cubicle, let's just say your space, but the big stuff God will take care of. It, it is written, and so it shall be. Okay. 23. And the Avims, which dwelt in Hazarim, the village, even unto Ezra, Ezra should be uh, translated Gaza. You know where Gaza is, even if today, okay? Avims means the ruins there, and it was the ruins of the Nethanim, okay? 
the captorums which came forth out of captor, the crown, destroyed them and dwelt in their stead. So it was. Verse 24, Rise ye up, take your journey, and pass over the river Arnon. Behold, I have given into thine hand Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land began to possess it and contend with him in battle. In other words, Heshbon is stronghold. I mean, big. I mean, you know, how, how are, are we still going to have wimps or are they going to fight? God's warning them here. You're, you're going to have to fight this one. You're going to have to do a little bit of this on your own. Now, we have the old generation that refused of battle age gone. What is the new strain going to do? Verse 25, This day will I begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee upon the nations that are under the whole heaven, who shall hear report of thee and shall tremble and be in anguish because of thee. Why? Because God's with them. That's a promise from God, and you want to accept that. Even as we enter into the promised age, you don't have anything to fear. God, God has promised that He gives you power and authority in the name of Jesus over all your enemies. You have nothing to worry about as long as you use this. That's to say the gray matter as it aligns with the Word of God. And that's very important. I said align with the Word of God, meaning doing it the way that our Father uh, advises. Verse 26. And I sent messengers out of the wilderness of Kedamath, th that's there at the beginnings, okay, unto Sihon, king of Heshbon, with words of peace, saying, in other words, always send out an ambassador first and see if you can kind of say, hey, I uh, want to talk with you, see what kind of peace we can build together. 27, let me pass through thy land. I will go along by the highway, I will neither turn unto the right hand nor, nor to the left. Thou shalt sell me meat for money that I may eat and give me water for money that I may drink, only I will pass through on my feet. We don't have war vehicles. We don't have chariots of war. We're, we're, we're just infantry, you might say, and children and women walking through. Verse 29, And the children of Esau, which dwell in Seir, and the Moabites, which dwell in Ar, down at the city, did unto me, until I pass over unto Jordan, unto the land which the Lord our God giveth us. In other words, this is, will take them all the way up to the head of the Dead Sea. They'll be on the east side, and as there, they'll pass Jordan, okay? Verse 30, this is the agreement he was willing to make with them. But Sihon, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by him, for the Lord thy God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might deliver him into thy hand as appeareth this day. In other words, God wanted them to possess this area. Okay. This was his way of doing it. You know, um, what does that say about our Father? Does that, was that wrong for him? No, he, he wants you to carry your own weight. He, he promised him, I'm with you. You're going to win, but you've got to fight. When the time comes, you've got to defend yourself. 31, And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have begun to give Sihon and his land before thee, begin to possess that thou mayest inherit his land. I want you to have it. 32. Then Sihon came out against us, he and all his people, to fight at Jahaz. Uh, Jahaz meaning trodden down. Okay. They're about to get it, too. 33. And the Lord our God delivered him before us. Don't read over that. The Lord our God delivered him before us. And we smote him, 
and his sons and all his people. You know, when the Lord delivers somebody into your hand after much prayer, he does it. That's the way you always win, whether it's political or what else. It's God's will, God's hand. When enough is enough, it's enough. 34. And we took all his cities at that time and utterly destroyed the men and the women and the little ones of every city. We left none to remain. This is a hard thing as Christians for us to absorb and to understand, but know this. When someone passes on, where do they go? They go to the Father. And Father takes care of his own children, and all people are his children. He never takes anything away that um, for those that are good, that they don't get something better. You can count on it. Verse 35, only the cattle we took for a prey unto ourselves that the spoil of the cities which, uh, of the spoil of the cities which we took. Verse 36, from Aurora, which is by the brink of the river of Arnon, and from the city that is by the river, even into Gilad. There was not one city too strong for us, and the Lord our God delivered all unto us. And there you have it. Who delivered it? The Lord our God. And here we're getting on up pretty close to the head of the Dead Sea. Up near Nebo, where Moses will pass all this over to the children, to Joshua. 37, only unto the land of the children of Ammon thou camest not, nor unto any place of, of the uh, river uh, Jabbok, nor unto the cities in the mountains, nor unto whatsoever the Lord our God forbade us. In other words, we did it his way. That's what's important. Do it his way today if you want his blessings. And I'm going to tell you something. Life without his blessings is, is not a great deal of fun. Okay? There's no pleasure there. you got to do everything the hard way and then end up failing most of the time. You've got to do it God's way. You've got to have him with you. He, you know something? In his promises, he, he has promised he will never leave us nor forsake us. But a lot of people will leave him. They, they get so conceited within themselves thinking, I am really something special. You're not. Okay? You're a child of the living God. That makes us all special. Okay? Because we are children of God. I don't care what race, color, or creed. God owns all the souls. And God gives gifts to some that deserve them, that are, are gifts that allow them to always help others, always leading others, always raising others up, giving them hope, truth, and Almighty God. So always have Him in your life so that you have those blessings you know, he knows what tomorrow brings in most cases. He doesn't necessarily know what you're going to decide to do. Uh, he, he knows, he hopes that you continue to love him so he can continue to bless you. You know, it does God's heart real good to be able to give gifts and to bless his children when they deserve it. But only, it, it's like he would say in the New Testament, when he would say, "Do the um, there's not one little sparrow falls to earth that I don't know it. Do you think I don't know about you? And look how beautiful the flowers are dressed. Do you know that I'm, I know about you? And then he says, it doesn't do you any good to make, to worry for one minute, but to trust him. And then he continues to say, when you do his work, he says, I know what you have need of. I know what you need. You do it my way, and I will give those things unto you after you do the work. Okay? That's God's deal. It's his deal in life. And he always keeps his word. 
That's his promise. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then we turned and went up the way to Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Edriai. And here we go again. Do we have anything to worry about? No, we do not. Well, why don't we have something to worry about? Because God is with us. We're following God's orders, and when you follow God's orders, you've got nothing to worry about. Verse 2, And the Lord said unto me, Fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people and his land into thy hand. And thou shalt do unto him as thou didst unto Sihon, Sihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbarn. And here, this is our father's way of gently but uh, turning the promised land over to the children of Israel. And, and so it is. When God gives right, it is right. Verse 3, So the Lord our God delivered into our hands Og, also the king of Bashan, and all his people. And we smote him until none was left to him remaining. We put him out of business. You know, this is why that prayer and asking God's leadership is ever so important today. You want something to happen that is honorable, moral, and in God's uh, um, pleasure, then ask our Father and believe Him and act upon it. Do your part. You will always be a winner, and those that come against you will always lose. It may take a little time, but they will always lose. You can count on it. That's our Father's way. One more verse to complete the lecture. And we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we took not from them. Three score cities, all the region of Argob. Um, that's this, this stony place, uh, the kingdom of Og and Bashan. They took it with God's hand upon them making it just perfect, making it right. How precious it is when you have Father with you. And when Father is with you, then you're going to be blessed. You know, your life today, when you have Him with you, it takes a lot of the pain out of life. And your faith in Him brings so many good things into your path that you can hardly count them. Your cup will run over when you do it His way in serving Him and being a service to our brethren. All right, bless your hearts. Don't miss the next lecture. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the Scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's Word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter, and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. Spirit moves. you got a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. It just is not right to do that. Why we have one judge, our Father. You want to always listen to Him for he is the final judge, period. It would have been much better off for that generation in the wilderness had they listened to him. But it, sometimes there's one day too late.
All right, then those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. You got a prayer request? You don't need that number. You don't need an address. Why? Talk to your father. That's what prayer is, is telling, talking with him. Let him know you love him because that's what he wants from you most. Hosea 6.6 6, documenting that. He doesn't want your burnt offerings. He wants your grace, which is to say your love. Okay. Let him know you love him for he sure loves you. And, and be blessed. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. And we're going to go with Mary from Mississippi. Do you carry any original Hebrew manuscripts? I'm interested in getting the eighth day man creation. Well, if the, um, we carry greens in a linear um, uh, works. There's a, it's a volume, four volumes, and it is the best set of manuscripts you can obtain. I do not um, like the, the, I mean, his work, is, it's better that you do your own work. What it does, it puts in your hand the least expensive set of manuscripts and yet the right manuscripts, okay, from the original that a man can obtain today. But you're, you're gonna need a little help. if Next time Genesis runs, or if you order the first six chapters of Genesis in video, I teach how to read the Hebrew and to know the difference in Adam and Eth Ha'adam, the two different men. Or you can pick it up on, in, from Greens if you're sharp enough and do it yourself. Elaine from North Carolina. What is the best Bible to study both the Greek and the Hebrew? Well, you know, I, I, you need, um, probably I still have to say the Companion Bible because it will call your attention. It's one of the only ways where you have a scholar that is aware of the Masera. He was one of the only Christians that was ever afforded the right to even edit the Masera. I mean, we're talking tall cotton right here, my friend. That's what Bullinger did. And um, these special points are called to your attention in the Companion Bible. But then, along with the Companion Bible, why do I recommend the Companion Bible most of all? The, the uh, scriptures have not been um, uh, weakened or changed as some of the newer translations, such as the NIV, it's bad, okay? It's got some bad errors in it, and it was deliberate, I feel. No one will ever convince me that it wasn't deliberate because it is, I know this places which are ever so important to identify Kenites or Satan's workings, and it just happens to be those that are changed. So uh, with that, you have the scripture as it is written in English, translated into English, but then acquire a Strong's Concordance. Dr. Strong was a fantastic scholar. And it gives you, the English reader, the ability. If I say a certain thing, if I tell you that Moses means in the Hebrew tongue drawn from the water, then um, that will assist you in knowing those Hebrew words you can look at. If you can use a Webster's Dictionary, you can use the Strong's Concordance. And that puts the Aramaic, the Hebrew, and the Greek at your fingertips, whereby as an English reader you can handle it. It lets, it lets you prove what I say is correct or you could prove it wrong. I don't think you're going to, but you can have a crack at it. It is my destiny to drive people into the Word of God. Okay. I, I, I will not force someone to believe anything or even attempt to force someone to believe anything. Everyone must sail their own ship. But if I can drive you into the Word of God, then I have accomplished what God would have me do, is get you into His Word whereby you have God speaking to you rather than some man. Margaret from Alabama. Pastor Murray, I work third shift 11 to 7 
and my pastor is pressuring me really hard to get to Sunday school. I try really hard to get to church at 11 a.m., but I get really discouraged. Am I making excuses? Is there a better way to do things? No. You, you have to sustain yourself. Okay. And, you know, if your pastor had to work from 11 p.m. till 7 a.m. in the morning, I wonder how he would like to show up at uh, 3 and uh, prepare his sermon for the day. I wonder how he would feel about that. He has no business whatsoever insisting that you harm your health to come to Sunday school when you're making every effort to get there in time for the service, not Sunday school. I would say you're going the extra mile. And uh, if that pastor pressured me too awful much, I'd kick the dust off my feet and let him have his church and find me one where people were a little more reasonable. I, I cannot imagine a man of God torturing you that way. That's pure torture, is to insist when somebody works all night that they be at Sunday school. I wonder what, if he teaches the Sunday school class himself and if there's any really meat there that would make it worthwhile. You might ask yourself that question. Um, Everyone, I never tell anyone where they can, could or should or whatever. Everybody sells their own shit. But don't, don't let somebody abuse you. You know, if you listen to a fool, sometimes you're a bigger fool than they are. And I will say no more. Leonard from Colorado. Does God forgive all sins? No, he doesn't. There is one unpardonable sin. That one unpardonable sin is to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, which is to refuse the Holy Spirit an opportunity to speak through you without premeditating what you will say as it's written in Mark 13 against the false Christ. And, and to do that, if you are one of God's elect, and you would have to be one of God's elect chosen before the foundations of the earth, to even be able to qualify to commit the unpardonable sin. I do not think it is possible that one of God's elect, you know, in the first earth age, they fought Satan tooth and nail. I mean, they're a different type person. They're not going to give in to him. So they're certainly not going to deny Almighty God, his spirit, to speak through them at that time, but that would be the unpardonable sin. Otherwise, divorce, adultery, um, all many other things are forgivable. There are a few things that are not forgivable in the flesh, and uh, that would we'll be covering those in this law that we're now reading, and uh, as it comes to pass, we'll draw on it. A lean from um, Oregon. Pastor Marie, where is the scripture about rulers being like children in the end times? Isaiah chapter 3, verse 4. Your rulers over you will be like little children, inexperienced, no experience, and doing childish things. Gene from Oregon. Again, I'll say it. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 4. If the, Gene from Oregon, if the Antichrist has the power to do miracles and many people will be deceived, yet these people are basically good people, will they have a chance? Well, they may basically be good people, but Father sent them a letter. Father sent them a letter telling them exactly how things were going to happen. I mean, he even draw, drew it out by numbers. Seven seals that you need in your forehead, seven trumps that announce the very action, and seven vials, God correcting each of those things. Did it by the numbers. Told you the chronological order of events. In Matthew 24, he explained all seven of those seals. In Mark 13, he explained all seven of those seals. Over and over in that letter he sent to you, explaining and even going as far as um, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, 
letting you know beforehand, boy, he's going to perform miracles in the sight of men, snapping his fingers and lightning coming from heaven to deceive those that dwell on the earth. Hey, if they want to be deceived, they're going to pay for it. They are not going to take place in the first resurrection. Now, they will have to remain spiritually dead, not physically dead, but spiritually dead. Hear me. Meaning, they will still be in their spiritual bodies, but they will still have a mortal soul. Mortal in the, the Greek tongue means liable to die. Okay. At the end of the millennium, if they let Satan deceive them again, they're going into the lake of fire. If they overcome, they will uh, enjoy heaven. It is not a second chance because many of them don't have a chance coming out. They have no idea because of certain preachers what the Word of God says. It's sad. Always teach God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby it is God's Word that is taught, not man's. Mary from Arkansas. In Psalms 3, verses 2, 4, and 8, there is a word, selah, after the verses. What does this word mean? Well, it's music, and it means pause, stop. And let me think just a minute. It's con it always connects something with something. All right. And if I remember right, in let's say verse eight, it, uh, 4 and 8, it connects the prayer or the wish with the answer thereof. Okay. Always, it always connects. The Psalms are such a magnificent piece of work as all of God's work is. But um, that's what it means. It means stop, think. A statement was just made. Now we're going to document it. Statement documentation, prayer, answer after the sila. Okay. Ted from Missouri, is it possible for a family to have a child who is a Kenite and a child who is not, even though both children have the same biological parents? And my sister is a hardcore NIV Bible user and I want to give her the scriptures where it shows they left Lucifer's name out. Well, um, Answer your question about Kenite, no. Uh, Kenite is a race of people, and if one was a Kenite, both would be, and if you study God's Word, you're not, okay, and neither is she. But because of certain teachers and so forth, things get confused, but as you know, the, where the NIV leaves Lucifer's name out is Isaiah chapter 14. And what is very important about that and what is so damaging is Christ is the true, Lucifer means bright star, morning star. Well, that's Christ's name. In other words, Lucifer copies everything Christ does. Why he wanted to sit on the mercy seat. So he calls himself the morning star. Christ is the morning star. Okay. This confuses people. And when you remove Lucifer's name from Isaiah 14, then you do much damage because the student, the new student, doesn't know if you're talking about Christ the morning star or Satan, Lucifer, the bright star. Okay. And, you know, the, um, the prophecy concerning it is extremely important. And it, it takes away from the Word of God. What bothers me just as bad about the NIV is, is in uh, Ezekiel 13 where the manuscripts very clearly state God saying, I am against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls. Do you know what the NIV translates that? Birds flying. It has nothing to do with birds. You cannot write birds into the manuscripts there unless you are deliberately trying to change God's Word and instill the rapture doctrine when God says, I'm against it. That's important. And, uh, but um, newer translations, there's a newer one yet coming out in the near future. It's where they have um, no gender. There's many places in God's Word there, there is no gender intended when many words are used among people. 
But this is, they're even taking away hims and hers and what have you. Talk about making the word confusing. That Bible will be out in a couple of years. Don't buy it. I will stand against that Bible. I will even advert, I will advise all students to not buy the thing. Do not waste your money. Okay. It's a, it's a contraption of deceit. Uh, Bunny from California, Satan's named himself Lucifer. Why, did, why and is this written? Also, where does it say that God created Jesus? And why does it say that? God, well, God didn't create Jesus. He's a natural birth. Make a note. You ask, you follow through on it. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. God promised way back, many uh, hundreds of years before the fact, that a virgin would conceive, and you would name him Emmanuel, which is to say God with us. And, and so it was. Uh, and uh, Lucifer did not name himself necessarily. It is just, and I think I answered that question in the prior question. I'm gonna, it's strange how questions run side by side like that, and so be it. Iris from Arizona. What should I do if I was a strong Christian before and have fallen? Repent. God loves you. You know, he, he knows we have weaknesses. You know, the main thing is Satan knows your weaknesses, and he will take advantage of them. Don't let him. This is why you need to stay focused repent and in Christ's name order him out of your life okay and be blessed by almighty God pastor Murray I've heard you talk about God's chosen one's bodies being changed when Jesus returns for the second time will you reveal the book in the Bible chapter and verse uh, the, and it's not only God's chosen ones that are changed everybody is saints sinners good bad and the ugly Everyone is changed in an instant, in the wink of an eye. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. Okay, got it? 1 Corinthians 15, 52. And I'm unsure as if the chosen ones who live in the USA will see Jesus come since Jesus is coming to Israel. Who do you think Israel is? Do you think the house of Israel is the house of Judah? Then you, you would sure be unsure about a lot of things and you would not be well taught, would you? If you're in the U.S. of A, you're in part of the 10 tribes of Israel that went north over the Caucasus, settled Europe called Caucasians and live here today. You're just a little bit confused. You need to keep studying your choice, okay? Uh, Nathan from Pennsylvania. My question for you is this. What would you suggest is the best translation of the Bible for a study, King James Version, and what is an apocrypha? The Apocrypha was a group of, of books that were undecided as to whether they should be a part of the King James, but they were inserted between the Old and New Testament in the original King James Bible. But I, I naturally, I suggest this, the Companion Bible because the manuscripts are accurate. And that's what's important. You know, if you have somebody study a bad set of manuscripts, they, they're losing coming out the gate. And as, as a teacher of God's Word, it really bothers me that the right for one to make their own decision is they are robbed by some um, higher critic. And a higher critic, I, I, I have to feel they make a living trying to destroy God's Word. Now, that, that's a hard judgment, but it's true. The higher critics make a living trying to destroy God's Word, that that is natural and that that is blessed and that that is divine, because most of the higher critics will not accept the fact that divine intervention happens. Many of them don't even believe in the virgin birth, and you would read their writings? I won't. Why should you? When you have works done by scholars of old who were trying their utmost 
to present the correct translation whereby you would have an, e uh, uh, an easy opportunity to learn the truth as God spoke it, okay? Uh, Caroline from, from Tennessee. If we have passed by the time the Antichrist appears, will we have a chance to stand against him or is it just for the ones that are in the flesh bodies? Well, it, it'll be naturally the ones in the flesh bodies, but during the millennium, you'll have a chance to, to teach and to, and to lead the people. Jack from Arizona, in regards to the Antichrist and the season of the locust, May through September, May through September, the five month period, what happens for the people in the Southern Hemisphere since their season is just opposite of the people in the Northern Hemisphere? Does the Antichrist appear to them six months later or earlier or what? Uh, I think maybe you're jesting because it means um, when that it's a five month period. If you make a study of the locust, regardless of what time, when that particular segment of the locust life is five months. God goes by nature many times, and when you study nature, it's easy to understand God's word. So naturally, it would not matter. It is simply a five month period, and it isn't necessarily May through September. Don't go to sleep. It could, he could appear, the Antichrist could appear in December. And that would really take many people off balance, wouldn't it? He comes as a thief in the night. Nobody knows when the thief comes. Okay. Um, we're out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter, verse to verse. Most of all, God loves you for it. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Most important though, you listen to me, listen good. You stay in His Word every day. And His Word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yahshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.